tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. <laughs> Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's program, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with audio adaptations of three rounds of frightening fiction about paranormal puppets, terrifying tattoos, and macabre mind readings. I'm Steve Taylor, and I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your wildest imaginations. Joining us tonight to help bring our frightening fiction to life are voice talents Jonathan West, Rob Davids, and as a special treat for those of you listening in today, Mr. Zach Galligan, the actor that portrayed the character Billy in the iconic 80s horror film Gremlins and Gremlins 2. We can't wait to show you what Zach's got waiting for you in his repertoire. And here's a hint. It's far more fearsome than an adorable mogwai. <laughs> now get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Our first tale tonight is a Chilling Tales original written by author T.J. Lee, creator of the viral creepypasta story, The Expressionless, and is voiced by special guest Zach Galligan of Gremlins fame. In it, we'll meet a single father doing his best to raise his son after separating from his wife and moving to a new home, who has his life turned upside down when his son discovers an old Japanese bunraku puppet in their attic while unpacking, which he hasn't seen since his own childhood. Unfortunately for him, he may not remember the puppet all that well, but the puppet certainly remembers him. Without further ado, I present to you, Mr. Promises. I've always considered myself to be a good dad. Patient, understanding, a good communicator, and strict but fair. That's how I wanted to be with my own boy as he grew up. It's never that simple, though, is it? You always have this image in your mind of how it will be when you're idly thinking about fatherhood or seriously thinking about it with your partner. But when it actually comes along and they aren't the picturesque baby that you envisioned, you realize the world you had in your head comes crashing down, and you're going to fuck up on more than one occasion. Most dads don't sit at their son's hospital beds praying for their recovery as a result of these fuck-ups, though. To explain how we got to this point, I have to take you back to my childhood. I was around 10, and my mom and dad had grounded me for TPing Mr. Watterson's house again and ordered me to clear out the attic finding things old and new to sell for a yard sale as a way of ensuring that I would learn from my error in judgment. I still thought what I'd done was hilarious. Mr. Watterson was a dick, but it definitely taught me to resist the urge in the future after saying goodbye to my Nintendo. While clearing out some of the contents of my back heirlooms, I stumbled across one of those old Japanese dolls known as a bunraku. It was at least a hundred years old, 
the paint smeared and cracked around the edges, the flesh-colored skin giving way to a more rotten wooden hue. My grandfather must have gotten it in Japan during the war, because my dad had no patience for cultural knickknacks, and I knew my mom would hate this sort of thing after seeing Chucky. His name was Mr. Promises, and the tag attached to it, written in crude English, read, A companion for all time. He will fulfill any promise you have with only one string attached. I looked down and saw that someone had affixed a pull string to him, clearly long after he was finished. I rolled my eyes at the terrible pun and pulled the string. It extended out farther than I was expecting before hitting the snag and reversing back slowly. Then, a raspy but authoritative voice rang out. Greetings. Have you a wish? Most fortunate. Mr. Promises shall carry it out. Simply speak the name of your ire and pull the string for that fulfilled desire. I shrugged, thought of how Mr. Watterson had seen me throwing the toilet paper over his house that night and in my ten-year-old brain blamed him for me getting into trouble. So I pulled the string once more and said, Mr. Bill Watterson. A sharp sound of a Japanese taiko drum being hit rang out, and the doll moved to assume a prayer position. Mr. Promises has carried out your wish. Now you must fulfill my own. Pull the string to finish this deal and begin to atone. Forget this, I scoffed, putting the doll back into the box and going back to cleaning the attic. After an hour or so, I went downstairs to tell my mom and dad I'd finished, but I didn't find them in the kitchen. Instead, I noticed our front door was ajar, and the two of them were standing in shock as blue flashing lights and several police cars and ambulances sat with their engines running. The police took strategic positions behind their cars, aiming at the front door, the curtains half-drawn, blood spattering the edges. Dad, what's going on? I walked up and stood slightly back from the gap between them, the feeling of danger in the air. It looks like Mr. Watterson has uh, had an uh, issue with his wife, and the police were called. He shifted and looked at me, smiling. I'm sure it'll be fine, buddy. <laughs> Head on up to your room. I was about to turn around when Mr. Watterson's blood-covered sweater caught my eye as he stumbled into view, leaning against the doorframe with the blood of his wife coating his face. Shaking, he held a 12-gauge shotgun in his free hand and had an almost trance-like state in his eyes. As he pulled the door open, it revealed the twitching body of his wife lying in their hallway. Mr. Watterson, drop your weapon and put your hands up now or we'll be forced to shoot, the officer called back as the men beside him held their guns steadily. Is it... is it done? His timid voice called back, the fear obvious even from this distance. Is what done, Mr. Watterson? The officer replied. No sooner had he done so, his deputy screamed, Don't! Mr. Watterson stood for a moment, his body shaking from side to side before nodding, and in one swift motion, raised the shotgun up to his lips, pulling the trigger and spraying brain matter across his doorframe. In a sea of viscera and confetti, his body standing for a moment before slumping forward in a sickening thud. While the whole incident was burned into my brain, despite my mom and dad attempting to shield me in vain, it wasn't the gore and the violence that scarred me. No, it was something far more disturbing than that. It was the far-off look in Mr. Watterson's eyes and where they were directed that shook me. They were looking into my attic. Naturally, after I calmed down and composed myself, I tried to talk to my father about the doll I found in the attic, but he dismissed it immediately. Mr. Watterson had problems and they got to him, Jacob, nothing more. It was all I could get out of him before the issue became borderline taboo to discuss. My family would never speak of it again, and subsequently it was forgotten, relegated to a subject that we dared not discuss lest the awkward silence fill the air and ruin any future gatherings. Time passes, the street moves on, and someone else fills the house the Watersons once occupied. I get older, and as is tradition, 
move out as my life takes me to opportune places. I'd say it's been about 30 years since that summer afternoon, and it wasn't something I gave much thought about until I returned to my family home with a new generation in tow. My father had recently died and my mother was now in palliative care, so it was up to me and my son to take over the house. I separated from my wife, so this was seen as making the best of a bad situation. My son Isaac was initially unhappy to be moving across state and changing schools, but he warmed up to the idea when I promised him pizza every night for the first week we were there. He was a good kid my spitting image right down to his precocious nature and the freckles on his nose. I began unpacking everything in the home and separating all of our things. I must admit that it was hard to see my entire life in just a few moving boxes, the entirety of an irretrievable marriage carelessly thrown in with mismatched objects. I loved my wife Sadie, but her drinking was getting the better of her judgment. After coming home from work to discover Isaac with a cut on his forehead caused by falling through the coffee table and a blackout drunk Sadie in the bedroom, I decided enough was enough. The proceedings didn't take long and I was awarded full custody. I promised her we'd visit if she went to a rehab center and I left soon after. If Isaac felt anything, he didn't show it. But I did my best to communicate with him on a grown-up level, knowing full well that kids pick up on far more than we realize. Like any seven-year-old, though, his mind was easily fixated on the next important thing in his immediacy, and while initially it was making friends or liking his room, it rapidly shifted to picking out where he wanted to put his bed and toys. His energy was infectious, and I told him to go pick out any room he wanted, hoping it might make him settle in easier. A few hours passed and the unpacking was mostly done, but I hadn't heard anything from Isaac the entire time. Curious, I scoured the house looking for him, wondering where he might be. I heard him laughing above me and felt uneasy as I could hear it coming from the attic. I turned down the hall and saw the hatch to it was wide open, an oversight on the cleaner's part, I imagined. Ascending the stairs, Isaac's voice rang out clearer, and what I was hearing made the hairs on my neck stand on end. So what do I call you? My name is Isaac Fitzroy, he said with that ever-present enthusiasm. The sound of a cord being pulled cut through the air before a horribly familiar voice replied back. Mr. Promises, have you a wish to be fulfilled? It sounded exactly the same from my childhood. But was the phrase always that short? Before Isaac could reply, I reached the top of the steps and my son turned to me, smiling. I tried to feign happiness, forcing the edges of my smile to curl up in spite of my fear. Hey, bud. Uh, who are you talking to? I asked, knowing full well the response I was about to receive. He's called Mr. Promises, Dad. Is this one of your toys? He beamed at me, clutching the ever-disturbing Bunraku doll tightly in his hand. I shook my head, the request that he leave it alone about to leave my mouth when he interjected, Can I keep him, Dad? He seems really cool. You have to understand, my incident was a long time ago, to the point where, in that moment, I was, as an adult, willing to do what most of us do when we're confronted with uncomfortable truths. Push it to the back of my mind and lie to myself. So when my son, who had just left his old life and mom behind, wanted a keepsake to make him happy, well, who was I to refuse? I nodded and told him if he helped me with the last of the unpacking, he could keep him. He was overjoyed and agreed. The next few days were relatively peaceful. We got on with our lives, and it seemed that Isaac was adjusting well. I'd occasionally catch him talking to the doll as if it were an imaginary friend, but the conversations always seemed to fall within the realms of what a kid usually talked about when playing, so I didn't really think much of it. I'll admit when hearing Mr. Promise's voice lines in response, it was almost comical. Isaac needed the confidence boost, and 
If that was found within a creepy doll from my childhood, well, that was fine with me. His happiness was most important. Over time, though, I began to observe small changes in him. Things that at first didn't fall out of the ordinary spectrum of misbehavior. Like breaking a toy in a fit of anger or throwing a tantrum because something didn't go his way. And in those cases, I'd just sit him down and talk to him about how he felt, which ended with a hug and an apology. But then things, shall we say, escalated. He would punch holes in the drywall, break his furniture, and even throw rocks at stray animals. Every time I confronted him about it, he would tell me that Mr. Promises told him to do it, and that it was part of his secret game. When I pressed him for more information, he would look up to his room where Mr. Promises resided, look back to me, and shake his head slowly and intentionally. This frustrated me, but as a single parent trying to adjust to a new life, all I felt I could do was talk to him and try and take away anything he loved for a short period of time. Last week, however, two things happened that would change the very course of our lives. First, in a completely out of the blue attack, he bit the babysitter while I was at work and did enough damage that she had to be sent to the hospital. I was furious when I got the news and took him immediately from our neighbor's house back to our living room to scold him. But even my anger couldn't match his, as he kicked the walls openly, trying to throw anything he could get his hands on. It was only when his eyes darted to the top of the stairs that he completely fell inert, his entire demeanor shifting and becoming that of a timid boy once again. I lost. I lost the game. He's going to be so mad at me, Dad. I'm sorry. Please don't punish me, he begged. I was confused but eager to help him no matter the cost or the stress. I'm not going to punish you harshly, Isaac, but you have to apologize to the babysitter, okay? And what game are you playing? I held his shoulders and made sure. I looked him in the eye when I asked, fearing someone was putting pressure on him to misbehave without my realizing it. I'll tell her I'm sorry, but I'm not being punished by you, he replied, his voice shaking. I'm being punished by Mr. Promises. I can't tell you about the game. I'll, I'll get in more trouble. Alarm bells now ringing, I sat on the floor and ran my hand through his hair to placate him, promising him he'd be safe with me if he just trusted me. You do trust me, right? I asked, hoping that things weren't any worse than what I already feared. It took a moment, but sheepishly, he put a small note in my hands before looking back at the floor, with the words, The Road to Promises, written in crude black crayon on the front. Sensing his shame, I decided not to make him stand there while I read the note. Go get ready for bed, buddy. I'll come tuck you in. Everything will be okay, I promise. He nodded, walking off to the stairs and repeatedly saying, I'm sorry, under his breath. While he was out of view, I opened the note and felt the bile rise in my throat at every sentence. The Road to Promises Mr. Promises is doing this for your own good. Follow the instructions like any good boy should. Every 12 hours there will be a new challenge, and for every challenge that you succeed, I will bring you closer to what you need. For every challenge you fail, a punishment you will entail. The game starts now, but do not fret. All pain is temporary. Yours hasn't happened yet. Your finest possession you must break, for we truly grow when our hearts begin to ache. When the penultimate game is done, pass this to the Father, with love from the Son. Mr. Promises will be waiting, Elder Fitzroy. Will you be participating? My hands shook as I gripped the letter, but I decided acting now would be too much for him, and that it was better to deal with in the morning. I sat with him and read his favorite stories until he finally fell asleep, still occasionally telling me he was sorry under his breath. As I left, I saw Mr. Promises sitting on his shelf, looking down and across the room at the sleeping Isaac. Disgust filled me and I took him quietly from Isaac's room and put him back in the attic for the night, electing to tell Isaac that he'd gone missing. 
Everything in me was screaming to keep him away from my son until I understood what he was. At least I could put him far away from his prying hands. Settling in for bed that night, I had no idea the mistake I'd made. It was a few hours later when I woke to the sound of a soft scraping coming from somewhere in the house. Being a parent and coupled with recent events, my mind immediately went to the worst case scenario and I leapt out of bed and listened intently for the sound again. It was coming from below me. I followed it down towards the kitchen and the sounds became more intense, the scraping accompanied by whimpering. Turning the corner, I was greeted with the horrifying sight of my son running a blade across the back of a stray cat. The blood dripped from multiple deep lacerations and coated the white floor in a vivid crimson. If the cat was alive when Isaac started cutting it, it certainly wasn't now. The limp and emaciated creature sprawled out on the floor as Isaac dutifully carved segments of it off with the carving knife, his face transfixed, eyes almost hollow as he continued. Isaac! Isaac, what the hell are you doing? I tried to contain myself, but urgency and shock overcame me as my voice began to rise. His arm stopped as he was bringing the knife down again, and he remained still. The entire atmosphere was tense. He was just a boy, but I knew I had to be careful with how I approached this, especially when he had a weapon. There was something else I couldn't shake there in the dead of night. I felt like I had to be on guard, not just from my son, but from something else. Isaac, look at me, son. I need you to listen. I began, crouching down to his level but keeping a safe distance, my voice lowering back to a calm state. We can talk about this, and I promise you that I won't get mad, but you have to put the knife down, okay? I took a small shuffle forward and I heard the smallest of cracks. Isaac's finger shot up from his free hand and pointed towards me, wagging in place as if to ward me away. Was my son in a trance? He'd never shown this kind of behavior before, save for the occasional nightmare. Isaac, is someone putting you up to this? Are they here with you? I asked softly, another step forward and focused on keeping the atmosphere calm. He sat near the center of the kitchen and I wasn't able to spot what was behind the island. When he nodded though, I stopped moving and I felt my muscles tighten. My cell was upstairs and I had no weapons on me. The alarm hadn't gone off and there were no signs of a break in. It was, he started, but a gruff voice rang out from behind him. Young Fitzroy, that would be most unadvisable. Our game is not yet done. Speak out now and Mr. Promises will hold you liable. Remember, you have not yet won. Isaac fell silent again and tears began to run down his face, smearing the floor and causing ripples in the blood as it made contact. My blood ran cold and the feeling of danger mounted with every second I kept my son near that godforsaken doll. Where is he, Isaac? Another step and I'm within arm's reach. Where's Mr. Promises? Isaac shook his head, whimpering and muttering, No, I can't, under his breath and with more and more panic, each time his voice cracking a little more. It's okay, buddy. We'll get through this, I promise. I began to reach out slowly for the knife when a sick laugh emanated from behind the counter, the sound of the cord reverting. Now! The voice bellowed as Isaac lunged forward and drove the knife into my shoulder. Pain erupted through my body as my vision began to blur, and the sight of my son's anguish-ridden face inches from mine intermixed as he pushed me to the ground, pinning the knife into me before running towards the door. Upside down, I could still see his blurred visage as he pulled the door to a close and whispered, I'm so sorry, Dad, before letting it shut. Long have I waited, patiently with breath so baited. Elder Fitzroy, you made a promise. It's true, now. I heard the clicking and scraping of wood as something began lumbering from behind the counter, out of my vision and towards me. One hand gripped my leg and then the other pulled itself up my torso, the clicking getting louder as it reached my neck, a pair of spindly hands pulling on my chin before a twisted, demonic face glared down at me. 
Gone were the human features of the Bunraku doll, instead replaced with pale skin, yellow piercing eyes, and an unhinged jaw filled with rows of small black teeth. Now you must fulfill your promise before the night is through. Your son's final challenge, that is already due. Its jaw crunched and clicked horrifically as it threatened to get closer, the raspy laughter filling the kitchen. The pain in my chest was nothing compared to the sheer terror running through my mind in that moment. Out of fear or stupidity, I swatted the puppet away with everything I had, pulling the knife from my shoulder and rushing towards the door, slamming it shut behind me. The instinctual fear of a parent overcame me. I ran straight to Isaac's room and I saw the door was shut and not budging. I knocked frantically for Isaac to open up, but there was no reply. Every eventual horrific outcome filled my mind as the cackling from downstairs continued. I looked around for something tangible to help me bust the door open when my eyes fell on the bathroom door. It was ajar. Oh no. No, 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 I began my anxiety building as I rushed to confirm my worst suspicions. The medicine cabinet had been raided. I took a couple of steps back and rammed my body into the door with full force, but it barely budged, my shoulder rushing with pain. No matter, try again. I reared back and through gritted teeth pushed again, the door giving way as I stumbled through. In the corner lay my boy, a half-empty bottle of pills on its side and his body twitching. I called the ambulance in a haze and watched as they took him away, not even having the energy to ask to sit in the ambulance with him. I felt like I'd failed him completely as a father. A neighbor drove me to the hospital, where I sat, waiting to see my boy. I decided to use that time to call our family and let them know what happened. While my wife didn't pick up, my mother did. The moment I heard her voice, I felt the walls coming down and everything that I'd bottled up rushed to the surface as the fear of what was going on overwhelmed me. Mom? Isaac? Isaac isn't doing so well, I began trying to keep my composure. He's taken a bunch of pills and, well, he's not been all right for a couple of weeks. I'm not sure why. Honey, I'm sure you're doing your best with him. Adjustments can be tough. It was hard on you too back then, she soothed, trying her best to be comforting from a distance. You were never the same after Danny died. Danny? Who's Danny, Mom? I asked, hoping she wasn't about to slip into a forgetful patch. I knew she couldn't help it, but I needed my mom at that moment. There was a pause before she replied. Danny Waterson, your best friend. You used to see him every day, until that summer afternoon when Bill did what he did. We should have never let you go to his house. Your father blamed himself for that until his dying day, you know. My stomach contracted and my hand shook as I held the phone to my ear. Ma, I I was home when that happened. I stood behind you and Dad when it all went down because I I was I was cleaning out the attic. Remember? I, I, I put toilet paper on Mr. Watterson's house because no, honey. You were at their house because he told us that you could help him clean the house as punishment. Danny did it as a prank. You offered to help your best friend. You were in the house that day when Bill... I began to feel sick. I began to remember things that I'd long blocked out. Danny is showing me the doll from his attic. Him wishing his dad was dead so he wouldn't put his hands on him again. The ensuing violence when I hid upstairs and clutched Mr. Promises. And then I recalled the moment I heard the gunshots. The visceral shriek from Danny's mom as she was blasted point blank in the face. Her brain matter splattering across the walls. The sounds Danny made as he was dragged from the top of the stairs near the attic entrance to his room. A pillow placed over him followed by a muffled gunshot. A manic voice ringing out as he called for me, blood-covered shotgun in hand while I'd sat motionless in his attic. I remembered Mr. Promises being next to me. I remembered pulling the cord and wishing to survive beyond anything else. Mr. Promises clapped his hands together, and in that moment, I forgot ever being in the house. 
I forgot Danny and I continued my life as normal. But I never fulfilled my end of the bargain. Mom? Uh, I, I gotta go. I'll call you as soon as I know more, okay? Thank you. My throat was dry and I felt my vision blurring from the stress. I put the phone down before I could even hear her reply and sought out the doctor. Is he safe? Is my boy safe? I asked, panic, riddling my voice as I controlled every impulse not to rush into the room he was being attended to. You're lucky you got him here when you did, Mr. Fitzroy. Any more pills or any longer and this might have turned out differently. Her kind eyes put me at ease, but I knew something worse was waiting for me. He's not ready for visitors right now. I would go home if I were you, sir, and we can call you when he's ready. I took her hands in both of mine, tears of relief and of fear filling up as I thanked her profusely. The moment he's awake, or if anything happens, I began, my voice breaking. Yes, we will call you. She smiled back. I left the hospital not knowing if it was the last time I would see my son or not, but knowing that the old saying rang truer in that moment than ever before. The sins of the father often do haunt the son. The house was a different entity entirely when I returned, the safety of it as a child and as a parent totally gone. Windows felt like soulless black eyes, the door still slightly ajar like an inviting mouth, and every step I took felt like I was simply prey, waiting to be devoured by whatever horror lurked there. The lights were off and I could see my own dried blood in the hall, a handprint on the stairway and a trail leading from the kitchen. The door now open. It felt wrong to even be here, but I knew that this had to be done. My son's life was more important than my selfish fears and desires to avoid the responsibility I set out all those years ago. Mr. Promises, I will fulfill my end of the bargain, I called out, still somehow feeling ridiculous talking to a goddamn puppet. But after everything I'd seen, it was a small price to pay. The Elder Fitzroy has returned. Fulfill his promise lest a liar get burned, he jeered his voice echoing around the house and bouncing off of every corner. Thirty years late, this fulfillment will be. What will you do if that's not enough for me? I paused. I had no idea what he would even want in return. I didn't know if this would be a fair trade or not. Danny wished for his dad to never lay his hands on him again. Though he got his wish, it came at the cost of his life. Would my wish ultimately have that end too? What did my son ask you for, I called out, Mr. Promises giggling. He wanted his family to be closer, more secure, so I presented him with a route to ensure that forevermore. I saw a figure move frantically in the corner of my eye. In death, your grief would rekindle your love. Your son could indulge too, looking on from above. It seemed no matter what way I looked at it, this was not a simple trade-off. Something had to give. But as I said, I consider myself a good parent, and that means that sacrifice is necessary, right? Whatever it takes, I will fulfill my promise, I replied, standing firm but internally shaking, terrified of what my life would be without my son. Consider it done, Elder Fitzroy. But if I were you, I'd keep an eye on your boy. He was right behind me. His voice sounded so real. I could hear the dulcet tones, but no breath. I dared not turn around. I may return one day for a new generation to see. Well, you know what they say. The apple rarely falls far from the rotten tree. It was another three days before Isaac woke up. The doctor said he was lucky to not have sustained any long-term damage from the pills he ingested though he is still suffering with mild amnesia and doesn't recall much of the last few weeks. He wasn't even sure why we were in this city, and after seeing me, the first thing he asked me was, Where's Mom? Suffice it to say, it's not going to be an easy road. I don't know what Mr. Promises is, and I don't know where he went after that deal was struck, but I never heard from him again. 
nor did he show up in the house. I got my son back, and I wouldn't trade that for any knowledge of what that monster was, so I'll stick with the blessing I have. Speaking of Isaac, the hardest thing wasn't explaining how he got to the hospital or the injuries he had. No, it was telling him that his grandma had passed away while he was asleep. He just couldn't fathom where she had gone and what had happened to her. Though truth be told, I think it's best he simply thinks she's somewhere peaceful. A secret I will have to bear for the rest of my life. I hope that Mr. Promises doesn't one day pay a visit to Isaac when he's older. As the saying goes, like father, like son. I hope you enjoyed Mr. Promises, as written by T.J. Lee and performed by Gremlin star Zach Galligan. If you enjoyed Zach's work, do us a favor and follow him on both Twitter and Instagram, where you can find him at his handle, at ZWGMan. Up next, we've got another tale for you. This one written by the very talented and prolific Richard Saxon and is voiced by 2017 Evil Idol voice acting champion, Jonathan West. In it, we'll meet a scientist working with his team to produce a device capable of translating dreams into a human accessible audio visual format. When the team decides to peer into the minds of man's best friend, however, they learn the hard way that it may truly be best to let sleeping dogs lie. Without further ado, I present to you, My Dog Dreams About My Death. Do you ever just sit and watch your sleeping dog? Observe as their little feet run along the ground, just waving halfway in the air as they let out innocent, half-gruntled barks. Have you ever just wondered what's going on inside their sleeping minds? What they're dreaming about? Maybe it's a squirrel they're chasing, or a ball. Maybe they're simply enjoying time with their life partners, their owners, their best friends. Or maybe what's going on is something entirely different, lurking just beyond the realm of what we can possibly comprehend. Something so terrible we'd be better off in the gleeful shadow of ignorance. I wish I could tell you this was all just speculation. Crazy ideas conjured up by a bored mind. But the truth is that I've seen what exists inside the mind of a sleeping dog. And it terrifies me beyond what I ever imagined possible. The idea of mind reading itself is an old one. And while it might sound like something taken out of a science fiction novel, we do possess devices that can give a basic translation of what occurs inside an individual's resting mind. In reality, in a dumbed-down version of neurology, everything we think, dream, and feel is a product of chemicals and electrical signals surging through our flesh, producing a flux of ideas and emotions which results in pretty much everything we are. With the right equipment, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to translate these impulses into text, audio, or even images. That's what I've been working on for the past decade. A device that not only reads the electrical impulses within your brain, but one that can also give a basic picture of what's going on. It might sound horrifying enough on its own, but don't fall into a pit of despair. This is nothing to be used as a torture device or to extract information from unwilling participants. This was always planned to aid those no longer able to communicate with the world surrounding them. People suffering from locked-in syndrome, unable to speak, but fully conscious, horrified as they've lost the ability to interact with the people around them. The device we worked on was supposed to aid them, give them a way of talking to their friends and family, to let us know they're still in there. The project itself was called Dreamweaver and came in the form of a hairnet containing hundreds of tiny electrodes able to read the brain's electrical signals from the surface of the skin. 
much like encephalography, it read brainwaves. But unlike the standard EEG, it was also capable of translating them. Even from the very early prototypes, we were able to pick up some vague shapes and sounds from our first test subject, which just so happened to be me. Both while awake and asleep, we managed to reproduce my thoughts, displaying them on a nearby monitor and then recording them. Awkwardly enough, the first dream happened to be erotic in nature, witnessed by all four of my fellow scientists, laughing hysterically as I was forced to confirm that they were, in fact, my dreams. But regardless of how embarrassed I felt, we were all ecstatic to have taken such a massive leap forward in science. After that first successful but slightly awkward attempt, we decided it would be more professional to find a third party of willing and hopefully shameless volunteers to share both their conscious and unconscious thoughts. A couple of weeks went by and we recorded grainy, hardly intelligible thoughts and dreams from about a dozen people, each aiding us in our goal to properly calibrate the Dreamweaver device and to translate the signals. The main problem that we quickly discovered was that while our technology was state of the art, the human mind was simply too complex to easily translate. There was too much noise, too many emotions, and an overabundance of useless information stored in our high functioning brains, all making it difficult to properly read anyone's thoughts with a high level of accuracy. Then one of my colleagues suggested we take a step back and start over with a more primitive creature. One that we can confirm has dreams, emotions, and thoughts, but to a lesser extent. Humanity's best friends, dogs. Yes, we could have used more primitive primates, but that meant time had to be spent on an excessive amount of paperwork. Dogs were more readily available. I was quick to volunteer up my own best friend, Robbie as our very first animal test subject. He spent most of his days sleeping away or eating anyway, so having us monitor his dreams wouldn't make much of a difference. All we needed was an endless supply of snacks and he'd happily drift off and snore wherever and whenever he could. It was something I'd noticed even as Robbie was a puppy, one who'd just eaten a half a pizza he found lying on a bench, swallowed in just a few seconds before I could stop him. Being a Bernese mountain dog pushing 100 pounds, carrying him home even back then, was a tremendously difficult task. I brought him to the sleep lab accompanied by his favorite toy, blanket, and a bag of snacks sufficient to put him into a coma for a couple of hours. As predicted, it didn't take more than a half an hour of enough petting and feeding before Robbie fell fast asleep on top of his blanket, snoring like a tractor and wearing the Dreamweaver. Now, we just had to wait for Robbie to go through the stages of sleep before finally reaching REM, the interval of dreaming. The image appeared quickly, just vague outlines at first, hardly resembling anything more than abstract art. But as we calibrated the machine, we quickly managed to conjure an image clearer than anything we'd seen in a human being. A remarkably accurate representation of Robbie's mind, vivid beyond what we thought possible, we saw the picture from Robbie's point of view, him running through what looked like a narrow alley, the ground full of debris, metal, and other junk. He sniffed frantically around, periodically lifting his head to reveal thick black smoke obscuring the view above. He stopped and barked, not a threat, but one calling out for someone before he kept moving through the alley and onto the main street. Just like the alleyway, it was poorly maintained full of cracks and covered by various trash. Most of the buildings around were on the brink of collapse, with one of them engulfed in wild flames that shot far up into the sky above. Robbie instinctively ran over to the burning building, defying his usually cowardly soul, and stood outside, growling at it. Before long, a woman burst out from the front door, her clothes on fire as she screamed in a mixture of horror and agony. He chased after her while she ran around in panic, only lying down in a hopeless attempt at extinguishing the flames. All the while, Robbie barked at the fire, not understanding that it wasn't a living creature, a thing he couldn't scare away. He just saw something moving around the woman, hurting her, and he wanted so desperately to help. It was a futile fight, and the woman couldn't escape the heat. 
Within a couple of minutes, her skin had melted with her hair burned away, and her own eyes turned to goo inside her skull. After what must have felt like an eternity of pain, she suffocated from the smoke and fell silent on the ground. Then Robbie woke up. He shot to his feet as he quickly inspected his surroundings, the horrible dream fading rapidly from his easily distracted mind. Once he noticed me there by his side, he immediately returned from worry to joy, violently wagging his tail and jumping up to lick my face. I petted him and smiled at his dumb, loyal face that had long since forgotten the dream. On the inside, however, I was filled with terror. What the hell had we just witnessed? Right then, I wished for nothing more than to be able to verbally communicate with my dog. The device we'd invented read minds, but it did little to translate it back to animals. There were too many questions for me to even begin. The main one being, how do you come up with such a horrific scenario? I'd had Robbie since he was nothing but a tiny puppy, small enough to fit in one hand. Destruction, fire, death, I mean... <laughs> These were all concepts he shouldn't even understand, let alone have the ability to recreate in such an apocalyptic scene. A nightmare to match anything I'd ever experienced myself. After a short discussion with my colleagues, we decided to keep Robbie at the lab for a few more nights, check if the dream was a one-time event, or if there were thoughts and worries that haunted him each and every night. Robbie, naturally, loved the extra attention he received at the lab and couldn't be happier. For the next week, we kept him close, feeding him, and making sure he felt comfortable enough to spend a sufficient amount of time sleeping. While most of his dreams were exactly what one would expect from a dog, running through the woods, chasing butterflies, eating all the food in the world, about a third of his dreams were exactly the nightmares we witnessed during the first experiment. A post-apocalyptic wasteland filled with the corpses of animals and humans just rotting away on the already broken streets, surrounded by collapsed buildings and a sky so consumed by smoke that the sun was nothing but a faint memory. In some of the still standing buildings I could recognize, landmarks from our city that Robbie hadn't even seen his entire life, yet there they were in his dreams, as clear as my own memories of them. He saw our ancient local cinema, our apartment building, the park, and the history museum. He traversed the desolate streets in search of any sentient life, but only came across bones of those long since dead, debris, and leafless trees looming over the streets. Whatever had happened to the world, it had caused utter destruction beyond repair, and if humanity had endured, they were nowhere to be seen. It wouldn't be until the fifth recording before Robbie finally came across another person stumbling aimlessly through the ruins. He collapsed to the street before he even noticed my dog, and it quickly became apparent that he too was standing on death's doorstep. Robbie wandered over and licked the stranger's face, whimpering as he attempted to wake him back up. His shirt had been torn and a partially healed, severely infected wound covered most of his bloated abdomen. He briefly opened his eyes, and smiled weakly at the friendly creature, there to see him off as he passed over to the other side of life. Once he let out his last breath, Robbie lay down beside him and cried, left alone in a broken world. Days passed, and we kept monitoring his dreams. The story they told was broken into different pieces and was hard to put together or to understand from a dog's point of view, but they always displayed destruction. And Robbie wandering through the lonely world, hopelessly searching for someone he'd probably never find. Me. Now, it could have been a terrible coincidence that my dog simply had the most creative imagination of any animal on the planet. I prayed that his dreams were mere fiction rather than a look into our bleak future. But if the world he dreamed up wasn't real, then how could he invent real places he'd never seen? Once we'd been sufficiently horrified by Robbie's unconscious mind, we decided it would be best to confirm our findings by monitoring other pets. A control group of animals from various places in the country, all who'd lived a long and happy life with their owners, safe from all the terrors in the world. We patiently waited as dog and cat owners signed up for the experiment, and while the pay wasn't all that great, 
they were more than excited to get a quick view into their loving pet's minds. Yeah, after all, there wasn't any harm in the project, and they were given plenty of attention and food to compensate for the new environment. After we gathered a couple of dozen volunteers, we got to work monitoring both their waking and sleeping minds, each for a week. We recorded their dreams and showed it to their owners after the fact, to prevent them from being exposed to the same nightmares we'd witnessed. Yeah, our plan was simple. If they had normal dreams, we'd just give them a copy of it on a USB stick. And if not, we would blame it on equipment malfunction and pay them their fee. No harm done. Most of the animals showed little more than your average dog catching a stick or a cat playing with yarn. And as we got through to the fifth, sixth, and even seventh subject without another incident, we almost allowed ourselves to fall back into blissful ignorance. But then we saw another nightmare. It was remarkably similar. A barren hellscape devoid of any sentient life. Just pets roaming the ruins, looking for anyone to keep them company at the end of the world. One cat dreamed of a minute society in the middle of the wasteland. Just 20 or so people clinging on to life in the middle of the immense destruction, all looking fatigued and emaciated. Another dog saw dried out oceans, only occupied by the occasional corpse submerged in the few puddles that remained, searching for half rotten fish and other dead animals it could feed off of. And then, against all odds, one found the half-burned remains of their former owner. And we could recognize her face as one of the volunteers, twisted in an everlasting expression of agony and confusion. <sighs> Whatever she had seen, or would see in the future, would remain a mystery. We ended the experiment there. Those lucky animals who had pleasant dreams were recorded and given to the owners. The rest were discarded, locked away on a hard drive to be kept hidden. And we apologized to the volunteers under the pretense that our equipment simply didn't find anything. Let's just say machine malfunction is a popular excuse in the science community. When they find something they don't want you to know. Following the dreadfully successful experiment, we handed the recordings and device over to more appropriate scientific groups. Whether we discovered something about our near future or not, we needed people with better resources to deal with it. A group called Artifacts quickly swooped in and took all of our equipment, with the exception of the first prototype, which I'd brought home to calibrate months before the ordeal. I decided I would check Robbie's dreams one last time before scrapping the device, hoping to find just another pleasant one I could keep as a memory. Away from my colleagues and the stressful setting of our lab, I fed him and he fell asleep in my lap, wearing the Dreamweaver. Just like before, I was presented with another post-apocalyptic world. As the hellscape came into view, Robbie frantically sniffed his way through several partially collapsed streets. He squeezed himself through a crack in the wall, entering a well-lived-in building, one that had since been abandoned, filled with empty cans of food and water bottles. In the corner, by the entrance, lay a man trapped under a slab of concrete. His lower body had been absolutely crushed, but he hadn't bled out as the pressure kept him alive and breathing. <laughs> hey, boy, the man uttered in a weak voice followed by unintelligible human sounds Robbie couldn't understand. He recognized the voice and immediately spurted over to the slowly dying man. In shock, I realized that the broken man was myself on the brink of death. Robbie, how did you find me? I asked as I lifted my hand onto his head. He bit onto my sleeve and tried to pull me out from under the debris, not realizing that in only minutes I'd be dead. He whimpered as he heard me groan in pain. And despite his lack of understanding of death, he could tell I was suffering. Without any other options, he simply sat by my side as the city before us kept burning, keeping me company during my final hour. I kept petting him until I drew my final breath. But he remained by my side, 
even as I turned to little more than a limp pile of flesh, rid of any mind or soul. Then he awoke in a panic, one that immediately softened as he found himself lying in my lap, back to safety, realizing it had all been just a dream, a dream of a future yet to happen. Whenever and however, you know, dogs only live so long. They know our future, but don't realize it. They just remain in our lives, the most loyal creatures in existence. You know, even as the world around them collapses, they try their absolute best to keep us safe because they love us. I hope this future can be avoided, but you know, <laughs> if not, I know that when my time comes, at least I won't be alone. I hope you enjoyed My Dog Dreams About My Death, as written by Richard Saxon and performed by Jonathan West. Up next, we've got a third terrifying tome for you, written by Kevin David Anderson and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 31, Rob Davids. In it, we'll get to know a tattoo shop owner who thinks he's seen everything. Until the day a strange woman and her most unusual friend walk through a door, asking for a piercing and asking him to ensure there's no footage of the incident. Why all the secrecy? Without further ado, I present to you Ink Spot. I'm a lot of things adulterer, barroom brawler. And if you count the war, kill her. But I'm no liar. So it rubbed me wrong to have to fib to my granddaughter when she asked me, who was the strangest person to ever come into my shop? Telling her the truth would have been a sin. No 12-year-old needs to know that the things going bump in the night aren't always products of imagination. She doesn't need to know that monsters are real. Hell, I'm in my 50s and I wish I didn't know. There's no going back. Not after that night. It started out like any other. The sun fell out of the sky fast, plunging Austin's Sixth Street Club into darkness. The kind of darkness that seemed to be an open invitation for the city's night things. Neo-punkers, hipsters, and bar hoppers spilled out onto the street. All believed the night was theirs. All believed they would live forever. I own the Ink Spot Tattoo and Pearson Parlor on the south end of Sixth Street. There's a head shop on my left and a new age bookstore to the right where all the young Wiccan gals seem to gather. I see them as they walk by my window, their long hair resting on flowing cloaks. <laughs> Makes me wish I was 20 again. On this particular August evening, I had just walked into the shop after my nightly viewing of the Mexican free-tailed bats leaving the Congress Avenue Bridge. I had seen it a thousand times watching a black cloud comprised of over a million bats leaving all at once in search of food never ceased to fill me with wonder. My assistant Chloe greeted me. How are the bats? Hungry. <laughs> it was my standard reply. She checked out early that night, leaving me alone to pierce and tattoo the dozen or so college kids that would eventually stagger in. By a little past eleven, there were three girls in the waiting room and one in my chair. I was doing a quick touch-up on a heart-shaped rose that had uh, faded from too much exposure to spring break when, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a very tall black woman speaking with the girls in the waiting area. Didn't notice her coming, but the hum of the needle draws most of my focus. When I had a second to look up, she was handing out money. Each girl quickly snatched some cash from the stranger and promptly left my establishment. Then the woman had the gall to turn my open sign to closed. By that point, my blood pressure was rising, so I stopped work and set the needle on my knee. An angry hand never does good work. The woman strolled to the back of the store as if her actions were the most natural thing in the world. Without addressing me, she looked down at the girl in my chair. Sweetie, how about you come back some other evening, and it'll be on me. 
The girl in the chair looked at the two hundred dollar bills held out to her, then back at me. With a sigh, I held up my hands in surrender and the girl jumped out of my chair. In the span of a minute, my establishment had been cleared out and I was alone with this tall, gaunt black woman. Her hair was cut so tight around her scalp, I swear it was painted on. She wore a black leather mini skirt, patent black boots, and a tight-fitting blouse with a macabre array of zippers. A long scarf completely concealed her slender neck. She looked Caribbean or Creole, probably from New Orleans or thereabouts. Still pretty pissed, I gazed into her brown eyes. You just sent about a thousand dollars worth of business out the door, honey. It was closer to three or four hundred, but I, I'm prone to exaggeration, especially when aggravated. Can you give me one reason why I don't bounce your butt out of here? She reached into her coffin-shaped purse and pulled out some money. I'd never seen a thousand dollar bill, let alone two. I need a piercing done. I heard you were good, she said. In the greedy glare of all those zeros, my anger evaporated. I snatched the bills and tucked them into my shirt pocket. First things first, though. The security cameras, they feed into a VCR? She pointed to three cameras mounted around the shop. Yep. Won't be much help to the cops catching the guy who blows my brains out if they weren't. I pointed to the VCR strapped under my work table. She stepped forward, bent over, then popped the tape out. If you don't mind fact was I did mind, but there were two thousand dollars in my pocket that seemed to scream, no you don't dummy. What kind of piercing do you have in mind? Not me, she grinned, showing her teeth. Him. She gestured to the front of the shop. My first thought upon seeing the figure in my waiting room was, okay, there's a dead man in my shop. But then it started shuffling towards me. Now I've got a walking dead man in my shop. As the man approached, it became painfully clear that he was deathly ill. His complexion was bloodless, and sweat dripped from his features. It was a hot August night, but not that hot, not by a long shot. When he was a few feet away, his body went into some kind of convulsion, flailing against the wall. Creole lady rushed forward, draped his arm over her shoulder, then... Dragged him back to the chair. Strong gal. Stronger than she looked. What's the matter with him, I said. Doesn't travel well. He'll be fine. His face was that of a corpse. I could see dark veins beneath his translucent skin, as if the blood in them had stopped flowing a while ago. I wanted to say, this boy needs a mortician, not a piercing, but I settled for, uh, I think he needs a doctor. They can't help him, she said. Now let's get this done. I looked into the man's eyes. They were hauntingly gray and very old. Ancient. I realized at that point that I wanted Creole Lady and Zombie Man out of my shop as fast as I could get them gone. Alright, I have a selection of stainless steel posts, studs, and hoops over here. What did- No, I have one. From her purse, she pulled out a small leather box. Embroidered on top was an ankh. It wasn't an uncommon symbol. Especially after that movie with David Bowie that I, I never got around to seeing. It's supposed to be Egyptian or some such thing. It means everlasting life. She pulled the lid back, revealing a chrome post of a very thick gauge. That's a bit big for a new piercing, I said. It doesn't matter, just do it. I tugged on some rubber gloves and retrieved the hardware from her creepy little box. I need to sterilize it. No need, it's taken care of. She snapped the box closed as the dead man in my chair convulsed again. Besides, there isn't time. She writhed in the seat and leaned forward with his head between his knees until the spasm stopped. When he sat back, his gaze fixated on my throat. His mouth dropped open and released a soft sigh. I swear he was watching the blood flow in my neck. While I was eyeing Zombie Man, Creole Lady had produced a set of handcuffs and by the time I realized what she was doing, she had finished cuffing her friend's hands to the chair. The ratcheting of the cuffs reminded me how much I wanted them out of my shop. Hey now, I raised my hands. I, 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 don't, I don't know what you two are into, but I don't do anything weird. Look, m maybe we should do this some other time. Your friend here seems real sick and, and to be honest, a little creepy, so... 
Creole lady pulled something else from her purse, then brought it up for me to see. If my mama told me once, she told me a thousand times. If it don't feel right, it ain't right. The small 22 caliber pistol Creole lady pointed at my nose seemed to echo mama's sentiment. Damn, I really should have listened to her more. No more screwing around. Get it done. Now, she snapped. It wasn't the first time a gun had been thrust in my face, but it was the first time I didn't question the gun owner's willingness to use it. All right, where does it go? I tried to sound cool. Left eyebrow will do, she said, gesturing with the gun. I leaned forward to mark the spot with a pen when Zombie Man suddenly lurched outward with his mouth, snapping in my throat like a rabid dog. Jesus! I can't do anything with him bouncing around like that! Creole lady seemed to have a moment of indecision. Then, in an obviously practiced move, she took position behind the chair and swiftly wrapped her free arm around Zombie Man's neck. With her other hand, she kept the gun aimed at my nose. Let's get on with it, she said. I took up my piercing blade. I pinched the skin above the man's eyebrow and heard a soft fracturing sound, like bone snapping. I thought perhaps I'd broken something on the frail man, but when I looked down, I couldn't have been more wrong. The noise was coming from his open mouth, and I watched in horror as his canine teeth grew a full inch. I recoiled. What the hell is he? Pop? You got less than a minute to get this done, or we're both real dead. Her eyes meant mine, and I could see that I wasn't the only one about to piss their pants. When I heard the bone splintering sounds again, I tried not to look, but I couldn't help myself. His mouth opened wider than humanly possible, and the rest of his jagged ivory was growing. His teeth looked like inmates during a prison break, scattering in all directions, escaping the confinement of his gums. Do it, she screamed. I reached up for his eyebrow again and my finger slipped off. I thought it was the man's sweat that was making him slippery, but I took a harder look. Hair was growing out of his forehead. It was thin at first, but in seconds it merged with his hairline and became as thick as anyone's scalp. Then the real noise started. Bone cracking sounds came from his whole body as he started to reconstruct from the inside out. His mouth pushed forward, becoming a snout barely able to restrain its teeth. The skin on his convulsing fingers splintered and cracked as claws forced their way from the tips, like newborn reptiles bursting through eggshells. Do it, she pleaded. I I can't even see his eyebrow anymore. Lord have mercy. Diving in, I made a hole somewhere about the eyebrow, or where the eyebrow used to be. As fast as I could, I shoved the unsterilized post in the hole as his teeth snapped at my arm. The handcuffs broke, and his clawed hand flailed. I backed off my stool, hoping to evade the monster's grasp. Creo Lady dropped the gun and tried to restrain the thrashing, hair-covered hand. She caught it by the fingers just as the claw on hair started to recede. After several more violent moments and, God help me, howling... Their fingers intertwined, and she pulled his hand back down to the armrest of the chair. The face of the beast withdrew, and in its place was one that resembled a Neanderthal, oversized hairy cheekbones, and a prehistoric brow. In a moment more, even those disappeared, sinking back into the normal folds of human expression. Creole lady uncuffed the man's other hand. He stretched like someone waking from a long nap looking much better than he did when he came in. He looked alive. Was was I a bother? He said to Creole Lady. No, sweetie. She kissed his forehead. We were running a bit late. That's all. Won't happen again. Promise. He spun in the chair and looked at himself in the mirror. Very nice, he said, touching the new pierced eyebrow. Creole Lady must have read the confusion that had to be all over my face. He doesn't have it under control yet. The silver helps. She smiled and turned to her companion. Let's go. You're on stage in an hour. She dug into her purse again, then stuck a couple of tickets in my shirt pocket. Come check out the show, Pops. I recognized the venue from the color of the tickets. A god-awful industrial music club down the street. 
No thanks. I'm a Crosby, Stills, and Nash man. Suit yourself, she said, then took her friend by the hand and headed for the door. They left my shop arm in arm. Creole lady stopped at the entrance and changed my clothes sign back to open. Then as quickly as they had come, they were gone. I stared at the reflection of the full moon in the glass on my front window and listened to my heart pound. After my blood pump returned to its normal rhythm, or as close as it would ever get to normal again, I looked down at the tickets. They read, One Night Only at the Boneyard, the musical stylings of the Lon Chaney Juniors. Yes, sir. I'll tell you what. This is one tale I won't be telling my grandchildren. I hope you enjoyed Ink Spot, as written by Kevin David Anderson and performed by Evil Idol 2019 contestant number 31, Rob Davids. If you enjoyed Rob's performance, don't forget, his narration was featured in the second round of our 2019 Evil Idol Horror voice acting competition, hosted on our official Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, now and active for the next couple of months. Visit our YouTube channel and vote on his and the other active entries in the competition today and help decide who wins. Round three starts soon. Again, you can find Chilling Tales for Dark Nights in the Evil Idol competition on YouTube. Just search Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube on any search engine. Or visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click the Evil Idol link on the navigation to see a current roster, contestant profiles, and links to all of the performances thus far. We and the candidates appreciate your support. If you enjoyed this show tonight and would like to stay in touch and help us grow, do us a favor and stop by our iTunes page and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. And to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure as always. I'm so glad you were able to join us tonight. And thanks again to special guest Zach Galligan of Gremlins fame for joining us tonight and lending us his special brand of talent. And if you ever see Zach around, please don't throw your drink on him, expecting him to turn into a hideous monster and multiply. That only works on Mogwai's. Everyone knows that. <laughs> Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. <laughs> Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, a production of Chilling Entertainment and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted by yours truly, Steve Taylor. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Roshek. Logo by Craig Roshek. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? We take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to us. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. We'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. 
but that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.